you. Uh, again, they're not strangers to any of us here, except, unless you haven't been here in the last two years. Uh, let me introduce Fresh Fire Ministries to you. After serving 20 uh, plus years as an Assembly of God uh, pastor in 1998, God called Bill and Beth Uni to travel as full-time evangelists. In addition to ministering in churches across America, God has opened up doors for them to minister in several countries around the world. They also have ministered in district councils, uh, services, Bible college services, and have, been, and have seen God move in huge and uh, huge waves during the services, and I, I know I've seen that personally. I personally have known them for many years uh, in the district, and they have ministered in, my, in the former churches that I've been in, at New Life Community Church in Oshkosh, and uh, Baraboo Assembly in Baraboo, and they are no strangers here as well. Uh, they are true friends of ours, and believe it or not, this is, at least since I've been here, this is their fifth uh, time with Katie and I here. Wow. And I still look as good as I do today. I know, isn't it great? Interesting how that happens. So with a huge celebration assembly welcome, can we welcome the ministry of Bill and Beth Uni? Come on up. Thank you.
Jackson. It's the old hymns of the church done country style, and uh, you wouldn't believe how many Alan Jackson fans there are in this world and how popular that CD is. But And both of those are $20 ones because they have two CDs in them. Also, we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter if you want to get our written newsletter. If you want to get our weekly emailing, write down your email address. You want to get both of them, write down both addresses. And then one last thing, we encourage you to please pick up one of our prayer cards. Bring the card home, put it somewhere you're going to see it. Whenever you see the card, remember us in prayer. Some of you have been praying for us for years, and we appreciate that. But if you don't have a card, or you lost the card, or you're new to the church, we'll pick up a card and pray that God's going to minister wherever we go. Last Sunday, we were in last Sunday we were in Nashville, Minnesota. They're praying for these, this service this morning. Week before that, we're in Dallas, Wisconsin. Week before that, we're in Millington, Michigan. Week before that, it was uh, Union Grove, Wisconsin. Now pray God's going to minister next Sunday in Stevenson, Michigan. Or right, week after that, we'll be in Ironwood, Michigan. Week after that, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Week after that, Two Harbors, Minnesota. And on and on it goes. Doesn't matter where we go, we need God every single week. So be our partners in ministry. Bring the card and reminder to pray for us. And we'd appreciate it so very, very much. I think that's all we're going to share regarding the table. We're going to ask you to stand with me, if you would please. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel or to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Acts, chapter number 19. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6 as our text this morning. Acts, chapter 19, reading verses 1 through 6. And this is what the Bible says, Acts chapter 19, reading verses 1 through 6, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And this is what it says. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said to him, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. If you're joined with me this morning, let's pray together out loud. Make this our personal prayer as we pray this prayer together out loud this morning. Pray with me out loud, please. Dear God, Dear God I, thank you I thank you for who you are, for who you are and for what you are doing, what you are doing. In, my heart, in my heart, in my life, in my life and, in and in this church. And this morning, and this morning I ask you yes. to further your work further in my heart, in my, heart, in my life. And in this church, in this church. Have, your way. have your way in me this morning, in, me this morning. in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. Amen. 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 You may be seated, please. I'm reminded of a story that George Wood tells when he was ministering in a large Assemblies of God church in a Middle Eastern country. When the building emptied of believers, the pastor of the church explained to him, saying, that hundreds of Muslims were at that moment gathering outside, waiting for the doors to reopen. Why were they coming? Why were they coming? Because they knew, they knew the Christians prayed for the sick and cast out demons. He went on to say, in that church, in that church, the question of whether we need or do not need the baptism in the Holy Spirit does not even come up. That question does not even come up, do we need or do we not need the baptism in the Holy Spirit? He went on to say, when you're confronting powerful evil forces, invading hostile enemy territory, confronting situations individuals have no human answers for, and facing situations where positive thinking and self-help techniques do not work, you must have a power that comes from God. And we need that power too. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the gateway to experiencing the miraculous, and it's the doorway to the supernatural. But you see, it's not only in the Middle East, but you and I, we are confronting powerful evil forces. 
You and I, we are invading hostile enemy territory. You and I, we are confronting situations individuals have no human answers for. And you and I are facing situations where positive thinking and self-help techniques do not work. We must have a power that comes from God. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit is that power. It is the gateway to the supernatural. It's the doorway to the supernatural. They needed this power also in Ephesus, as we read in our text this morning. We find that Paul came to the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a large metropolitan city, a good-sized city in their time. I read where it was about a population of about 150,000 people, which was a good-sized city in that period of time. And Paul comes to this large metropolitan city, and there he finds 12 men. If you write, read verse 7, it says he found 12 men. 12 men who are followers of Jesus, he comes across disciples, as he calls them. And the first question that Paul asks them in the Old King James Version is, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And that is the question that is the title of our message this morning, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? We want to look at three points this morning. First of all, what Paul believed. We find that as Paul came across these disciples in Ephesus, there are three things that he believed. Number one, first of all, he believed that they were disciples. Paul calls them disciples. And we find that Luke, when he's writing about this, this incident, he calls them disciples. And whenever Ruth, or Luke, I should say, not Ruth, but Luke, whenever he's writing in the book of Acts and he calls people disciples, in every one of the cases, they are referred to as followers of Jesus Christ. And so Paul believed that these people had already made a commitment of their life to Christ. They were disciples. Second of all, Paul believed that there was an added dimension of the Holy Spirit available to every believer that could be received after salvation. And that's why Paul asked these believers, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now if you look at the Greek wording that is there, the word that is translated in some versions of the Bible, when, other translations like the Old King James says since, the Greek word is apo, A-P-O, and it literally means away from or separate. In other words, away from or separate from when they believe. That's why the King James translation translated it as since. And so Paul is asking them, did you receive the Holy Spirit after you believe? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believe? Paul knew that as believers, they already had the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. Because every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. The moment a person becomes a believer, the moment a person makes a commitment of their life to Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit. Just like back in the Gospels, in John chapter 20, verse 22, we find when after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and the Bible says there, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. I compare that to today when a person today makes a commitment of their life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells within them. Every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. Every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. But then we find to these same disciples that Jesus had breathed upon and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. To these same disciples, Jesus said, there's still something more for you to receive. That's why in Luke 24, verse 49, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But wait in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And that's what they experienced on the day of Pentecost. Here in our text, Paul wasn't talking about receiving the Holy Spirit that comes at salvation. He didn't need to ask that. The Holy Spirit automatically comes and dwells within every believer the moment they accept Christ. That's automatic. They didn't need to ask for that. Paul didn't need to ask if they had the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. 
But Paul believed that there was a separate additional experience available to every believer, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul was asking them. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit since you believed? Thirdly, Paul believed that this was important. As Paul came across these believers, he thought this was important enough to ask. Have you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit since you believed? We find Paul not only thought this was important, but the early church thought this was important. We find in Acts chapter 8, when the early church heard there were all these new believers down in Samaria. The early church took Peter and John away from what they were doing, sent them 35 miles down to Samaria to tell these new believers about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. To the early church, we find this was important for all believers. Secondly, the early church thought this was a gift for all believers. Thirdly, the early church thought this was normal for all believers. The early church thought this was for all believers. Paul thought this was important for all believers. So Paul believed they were disciples. Paul believed that there was an added dimension of the Holy Spirit available after salvation. And Paul believed that this was important. The second point this morning, why the baptism in the Holy Spirit is important. Why did Paul ask them if they had received the baptism in the Holy Spirit since they believed? Why bring it up? Why ask? Why was this important? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, first of all, this was important because it was promised by Jesus. If Jesus promised this, this was important. Jesus promised in Acts chapter 1 verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. If someone promises something, it's important to them, especially when it's their last words, it was, which it was in Jesus' case. Also when time is short, and when words have to be chosen carefully. When Jesus was down to his last words, he was talking about and promising the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was ready to go up into heaven, he spoke of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus saw this as important. Therefore, Paul saw this as important. And if Jesus saw this as important, and Paul saw this as important, shouldn't you and I see this as being important also? Secondly, this was important because this was commanded by Jesus. He commanded his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Notice what happens in Acts chapter 1 verse 4. Listen to what it says. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you have heard of from me. One day as I read that portion of scripture, that word commanded just kind of jumped out at me. Jesus didn't imply to them, he didn't suggest to them, he didn't insinuate to them, but he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise, which he said you have heard of from the, from the Father, we have heard of by me. Jesus saw this as being so important that they were not to start without this. So this was important because it was commanded by Jesus. And then thirdly, this was important because this would be immensely helpful to them. Jesus saw this as being so important and so helpful that they were not to start without this. So how would the baptism in the Holy Spirit help them? Let me give you three ways. Number one, the baptism in the Holy Spirit will help them with power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The word power literally means ability and it means enablement. Let me give you some reasons and some ways that the baptism in the Holy Spirit gives us power and helps us. First of all, the baptism in the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live the life that Jesus wants us to live. He gives us the power so we can live the life that he's asking us to live. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own power. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live the life that he's asking us to live. And we need that power today. With all the opposition, with all the attacks, and with all the secularism in our society, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to live the life 
that Jesus is asking us to live. Second of all, he gives us the power to proclaim the message of Christ. We were mentioning it in the, in the Sunday school class that it was, it's kind of interesting, those early disciples, prior to being baptized in the Holy Spirit, these very ones that were supposed to go out with the message of Jesus to the world, on the night when Jesus was arrested, what happened? They scattered, they hid, they fled. Just like rabbits, shoo, they were gone. After they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, those same ones who had hid, scattered, and fled, they went out with an undeniable power, proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Yeah. There was a new power that came into their life after they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. The way I've often illustrated from my own life, prior to being baptized in the Holy Spirit, I found out I couldn't share my faith with anybody. It just made me nervous and scared just to think about it, let alone doing it. I, I remember getting challenged in my own heart to be a witness. And oh, I just wanted to be a witness and tell people about Jesus. But the thought of doing it just petrified me. Then I thought, I know what I can do. I can get some tracts and I can hand out the tracts at the college I was attending at that time. I thought, no, I can't do that either. Then I came up with a plan. You'll think this was the most pathetic plan you've ever heard in your life. But I, I know what I'll do. I'm going to get a handful of tracts, and I'm going to bring those tracts to the college. I was going to McGibby Community College in Ironwood, Michigan at the time. And I, I'll bring those tracts to the college. And I'll run into the men's room, and I'll put them on the mirror. I'll be, put them on the shelf below the mirror. So that they came to carry out the plan, and I had that handful of tracts, and I showed up at the college. And there I stood in the hallway, make sure nobody's coming or going. They want to get surprised. And so I saw the coast was clear. I ran into that bathroom. I put those tracks down on the shelf and I ran out that bathroom probably faster than anybody ever run out that bathroom before. You say that's pitiful, but that's the way it was. But I found that after I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, there was a new power that came into my life. I found I could talk to people about Jesus. I found I could hand out tracks. When we were going to North Central Bible College, the church we went to, Roseville Assembly, they had a, a program back then called, called Evangelism Explosion, where you just go door to door sharing your faith. I found I could do that. Beth was able to do that. We, when we were in our second pastorate, we had a ministry called Fishers of Men. We just drew a 10 mile circle around the church and went from house to house trying to share our faith. I found there was a new power that came into my life. There's a power to proclaim the message. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, a power to follow. We can follow his plan, his will, his desire for our lives. I tell you from my own experience, I am the least likely person to be doing what we are doing. The least likely person. I could not give a book report in school. I could not give a speech in school. I would be sick to my stomach throwing up into a sink any time I had to speak in front of the class at school. And God ends up calling somebody like that to be a pastor and then to be an evangelist. But there's a power that comes into our life to follow his plan for our life. We've got the power to follow whatever his plan is for our life. Another thing is it gives us the power to endure hardships. Just because we're believers, we're not immune from hardship. Just because we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're not immune from hardship. Trials will come. Let me ask you, did Paul ever have any trials? Oh my, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was in prison, he, he was left for dead. And oh my, there was all kinds of hardships, one after the other. But as we always tell people who get baptized in the Holy Spirit in our services, I'll tell them in the follow-up instructions, you've got a new power in your life. And that power is bigger than any problem you're ever going to face. Whatever the problem is, whatever problem you face, you're going to make it through that, through the power of the Holy Spirit if you allow Him to empower you. We've got a power to endure hardships. And then we've got the power to say no to sin and distractions. Sin and distractions will come, but we have the power to overcome the sin and the distractions. And then also we have the power to handle when God says no. Are there times when God says no? Unless you read a different Bible than I do, there are times when God says no. 
There was a time when Paul wanted to minister in Asia, and God said no. So then Paul says, okay, I'll go to Bithynia. And God says no. But then later God says, I want you to go to Macedonia. But God said no to those first two desires. And then God said, I've got a better plan. I want you to go to Macedonia. There was a time when Paul had the thorn in his flesh. Paul says three times, three times I asked that God would remove this. But God did not remove the thorn in the flesh. But God said instead that my strength is made perfect in weakness. The Holy Spirit Baptist would give him the strength and the power to deal with those times when God says no. And hey, whenever God says no, he's got something better in store. Amen. Hang on to it. He's got something better in store when God says no. And today you find people are filled with fear. People are filled with trials. I mean, my, we're living in a world with COVID-19. We're living in a world of civil unrest, a world with political gridlock. Unemployment affecting some people. Terrorism is in our world today. The crime rates are going up. There's family issues. There's personal issues. But I tell you this morning that the baptism of the Holy Spirit can enable us to stand strong. To be what Jesus wants us to be and to do what Jesus wants us to do. Regardless of what is going on out there. One of my favorite ways of illustrating it is this way. I maybe have used this illustration before. I always remember what I've preached before, but I don't remember the stories I've told. And, but anyway, you could go to the nearest McDonald's and you could pick up a soda straw at their soda counter. You could take that soda straw, bring it down to the children's church, and the youngest child would bend that soda straw. No effort, no effort, no energy at all. The youngest child could bend that soda straw. But you could take that same soda straw and give it to the strongest man in the sanctuary. And we were to find a nail that was as long as that soda straw. A nail that was as thick as that soda straw. We were to insert that nail down into that soda straw. I submit to you this morning that the strongest man in the sanctuary could not bend that soda straw with that nail inserted into it. I liken that as what the baptism in the Holy Spirit does for the follower of Jesus Christ. Baptism in the Holy Spirit enables us to stand strong. Be what Jesus wants us to be. Do what Jesus wants us to do. Charles Crabtree, our former assistant general superintendent, said it this way. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is like putting a strong man into the body of a 90-pound weakling. That's what the baptism in the Holy Spirit does. Enables us to stand strong regardless of what's on the news, regardless of what's in the newspaper. The baptism in the Holy Spirit enables us to stand strong. Be what Jesus wants us to be. Do what Jesus wants us to do. Second of all, the baptism in the Holy Spirit helps with prayer. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we got a new dimension to our prayer life. We can pray in the Holy Spirit. We can pray in our prayer language. The Bible refers to it several times. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Praying in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. For he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we've got a whole new dimension to our prayer life. Let me just share an illustration I came across a while back. John McGarvey tells a story. He said, one day the church copy machine broke down. So he said, I called the repair shop to see if they could tell me over the phone how to fix it. He said, after a few moments on the phone, it became obvious that this wasn't going to work. I didn't know the names of the parts. I couldn't even adequately describe what was broken. It wasn't going to work. So the repair shop sent out a technician. After a few moments, he called back to the same shop. John McGarvey says, unlike me, he knew how to describe what was needed. He used words I did not understand, but the person at the shop did. And soon the copier was repaired. He said, my need was met because someone came and communicated to headquarters in words that I could not express. That's what Paul is teaching us in Romans chapter number 8. When we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit knows precisely what we need and prays in a language that the Father perfectly understands. We can pray in our prayer language. We can pray in the Holy Spirit. And it is a tremendous asset to our prayer life. 
Jackie Pollinger summarized it this way. She said, after she got baptized in the Holy Spirit, at first she didn't pray in the Spirit until somebody pulled her aside and said, you need to put this to use every day in your life. And she started praying in the Spirit. And she said, when I started to pray in the Spirit, he started to work. And no one works like him. It revolutionizes our prayer life. And thirdly, the baptism in the Holy Spirit helps with praise. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, Paul says, I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. We can not only sing in our native language, but we can also sing in the Holy Spirit. It's a new dimension to praise and worship. Thirdly and lastly, receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Paul asked if they had received the Holy Spirit since they believed. They said, we have not even heard that there is such a thing. So Paul then explains it to them. First of all, they had only been baptized in the baptism of John. So baptizes, but John, Paul baptizes them now in the name of Jesus. And so then Paul explains to them regarding the Holy Spirit. Because when Paul asked if they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, they, they said, we haven't even heard of such a thing. So Paul explains it to them. And then he laid hands on them. And he prayed for them. But they had not even heard there was such a thing. It was new to them. Maybe it's new to some of you. It was new to me. Because you see, I did not grow up in a Pentecostal church. I did not grow up in a charismatic church. I did not grow up in a church that believed in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You might say, preacher, I don't have any church background. It's new to me. Well, it's new to me too. Or you might say, I come from a liturgical church background. Maybe Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian. Spent the first eight years of my life in a liturgical church. Wonderful people, but never heard about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Or you might say, well, I come from an evangelical church background. Maybe Baptist or Nazarene or evangelical free. Spent the next eight years of my life in an evangelical church. Wonderful people. People who love Jesus. People committed to Christ. People I will forever be indebted to. Because it was during that eight-year period, the age of ten, I made a commitment to my life to Jesus. Greatest decision I've ever made in all of my life. I remember hearing them preach, teach, and talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They preach, taught, and believe what was in the book of Acts was powerful, what was in the book of Acts was real. But they also believed when the book of Acts ended, so did the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I didn't see people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't see, desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit because people told me it wasn't for today. Then in my late teenage years, my parents began to go to an Assemblies of God church. It was the Ironwood Assembly of God in Ironwood, Michigan. And it was there that I began to hear about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I learned that Peter, when he explained on the day of Pentecost what was happening in that upper room as the baptism in the Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter said in Acts 2.39, this is for you, this is for your children, this is for those who are far off, for as many as the Lord our God shall call. I learned it had not ended with the book of Acts like I've been told all those years, but I learned it was still for today. I learned it was for any believer and every believer and all believers. Then I became open as we kept going to that church. I became open to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know what? Like, I believe it's for you, Lord. And it's nice those people have it. But I don't think I need this. Then as we kept going to that church, I began to cast or desire the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know, saying, I believe it's for you, Lord. And Lord, if you want to hit me with it, you go right ahead. Kind of as a two-by-four, he's going to hit me with one day. You know, we're going to ask God for this, or we're going to seek God for this. But you want to nail me with it, you go right ahead. By the way, with that mindset, chance are very slim we're going to receive. He expects us to ask. Jesus, when speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, And how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him, to those who ask Him? And then it got to the point where I really wanted to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know what happened? I got prayed for in church, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. So I thought, I'll pray on my own. Pray on my own. Nothing happened. Well, by now, I was a student at Northern Michigan University, Market, Michigan, majoring in business. Never forget this night as long as I live. I've been in the library studying that night. And it was now midnight, and the library was closing. We left the library that midnight, started walking across an empty vacant field between the library and my dormitory. I started walking across an empty vacant field. Hey, it's the middle of the night. Nobody's around. So I just started praying out loud. Lord, I just want all that's a promise. Lord, I want all that's available. Lord, just baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And before I could fully realize what happened, 
I thought there was a lot of praying in English, but I was praying in another language. Got baptized in the Holy Spirit walking across a field in the middle of the night at a second the university. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit changed my Christian life. I found a new power in my life. I found I could speak in front of a group of people. I found a new dimension to prayer. I found a new way to build myself up spiritually. Jude said, Beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit revolutionized my Christian life. In closing this morning, the question was asked in our text, Have you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit since you believed? The baptism in the Holy Spirit is promised to every believer by Jesus. It's commanded for every believer by Jesus. And it can be immensely helpful to every believer according to Jesus. But Jesus never forces the baptism in the Holy Spirit on anybody. Neither does his church, neither do your pastors, and neither do we. But if this is available, why wouldn't anybody want this? If this is promised, this is commanded, and this is helpful, why wouldn't anybody want this? Let me finish with this illustration. You can picture a Christmas scene. A Christmas tree is set up, and two beautifully wrapped gifts are under that tree with your name on them. Two wonderful, wonderful gifts. A person opens up one gift, and then they walk away and they leave the other one. We would wonder, what's wrong? What's wrong with them? It would be unheard of to not open all the gifts that are open, or all the gifts that are available for us. Well, God has made two gifts available to us. Christmas reminds us of the first gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He provides the gift of salvation through his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the first gift. But this morning we've preached on the second gift, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, Paul said, or Peter said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, why not open both gifts? Let's not leave any gifts from our Father unopened. And if we have previously opened it, let's not lay it aside. But well, let's keep it in use in our lives. Amen. Let's bow our heads together in prayer this morning. Beth, if you come to the piano, please. Father, this morning we thank you and we praise you from the very depths of our heart for who you are. Father, this morning we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And Father, this morning we are so thankful and so grateful for Jesus. We thank you for that first gift, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. That you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus into this world to die on a cross for our sins. Father, we realize we were not deserving. We did not merit it. We were not worthy in any way. But we thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, we realize that without Jesus, we have no relationship with you. Without Jesus, we're on our own to make it in this life. Without Jesus, we have none of the Holy Spirit in our life. And without Jesus, we've got no hope waiting for us in heaven. We realize that without Jesus, we have nothing. But we're so thankful this morning that Jesus stands with his arms wide open, just waiting for us. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for us. We also realize you never force anything on anybody, but you wait for us to give you the invitation to come into our life. You're waiting with open arms open arms. This morning you might say, Preacher, I've come into this service and I've never made a commitment to my life to Christ. And without a commitment to our life to Christ, we have no relationship with God. Are on our own to make it in this life. No hope waiting for us in heaven. None of the Holy Spirit in our life. Ineligible for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Good news this morning is he stands with his arms wide open, just waiting for you. Secondly, you might be here this morning, say, Preacher, I've done that before, but you know, you know, you know that as you're sitting here this morning, you're not living by that commitment you made to Christ. And something we commit in our life to years ago, we're not living by today, doesn't do us any good. 
the issue isn't years ago, the issue is where we at this morning. But the good news is he stands with his arms wide open and says, come back to me, come back to me this morning. Third, he might be here this morning and say, preacher, I am a follower of Jesus, but there's stuff in my life that should be there. Now I need Jesus to cleanse me, to wash me, to forgive me of the sin in my life. And the good news is he stands with his arms wide open, just waiting to cleanse, to wash, to forgive. If we're just willing to admit to acknowledge our sin and ask for his forgiveness. And be willing to repent and turn from the sin. He stands with his arms wide open, just waiting. This morning, in this first altar call, we're not going to have you come forward. But just simply right where you're seated in a moment, if you need to make that commitment of your life to Christ. You need to recommit your life to Christ or you need cleansing and forgiveness from sin. In a moment, we're going to ask you to slip up your hand and then we're going to have one word of prayer for everyone who slips up their hand this morning. So this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, the moment looking around, please, if you need to make that commitment of your life to Christ or you need to recommit your life to Christ or you need cleansing and forgiveness from sin, this morning, right here, right now, Right where you're at, just slip up that hand right now. Just slip it up quickly. I see that hand, you may put it down. I see that one, you may put it down. Are there others? Are there others? Are there others? Are there others? I see that one, you may put it down. Still others, still others, still others. I see that one, you may put it down. Still others. Father, we thank you for what you're doing by your Holy Spirit this morning. We thank you for tender hearts that are responding to the tuggings of your Holy Spirit. And Father, this morning, you love, we know that you love them, and we know that you are thrilled with the tenderness of their hearts and at their response. Father, this morning, we ask that you'll minister to the very reason why they have raised their hand this morning. I pray, Father, this morning, you will cleanse them, you will wash them, you will forgive them of the sin in their life. As they, in this quiet moment, right where they're seated, as they in this quiet moment just admit and acknowledge their sin to you. And as they ask for your forgiveness, I pray you, the forgiver of sins, will cleanse them, wash them, and forgive them of the sin in their life. And Father, this morning we ask that you'll come and live within them by your Holy Spirit if you're not already there. And Father, we ask that you will help them as they live for Jesus from this day on. We thank you for your cleansing and forgiveness. Thank you that you dwell within us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're going to help us as we live for Jesus from this day on. Father, we just say thank you, thank you, thank you from the very depths of our heart for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We just say thank you for what you've done in hearts and lives this morning. And Father, we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.